Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we are finally doing it, the first of a two-part series about one of the largest, most well-known companies out there, Amazon. And I admit, I might still use Amazon after this, and I probably will, and I, I kind of hate saying that. The prices, the two-day shipping, the stupidly gigantic variety is something I almost rely on at this point, and I feel like I'm not alone in saying that either. But considering how many people use them, it's kind of worth knowing who you're ordering from and what Amazon stands for, and unfortunately what it doesn't stand for either. Now, Amazon's entire history and everything they've done is a lot to go over. So if I miss a couple of smaller pieces in the story, I apologize in advance, but I'm going to try and just focus on their highlights as a company. Amazon was founded in 1994 by Jeff Bezos and his wife, Mackenzie. Originally, it was meant to be an online bookstore in Seattle because of the city's reputation as a tech hub. They started with $10,000 out of pocket and spent early days working in a garage on desks made out of doors purchased from Home Depot. Despite its humble beginnings, Amazon obviously didn't stay small for long. They officially opened in 1995, and the first ever order was placed on April 3rd of that year for a scientific book called Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies. When Amazon.com went live to the general public in July 1995, the company boldly billed itself as Earth's biggest bookstore. Although sales were initially drummed up solely by word of mouth and Bezos insisted with assembling orders and driving the packages to the post office. However, by the end of 1996, Amazon had racked up $15.7 million in revenues. And in 1997, Bezos took the company public with an initial public offering that raised $54 million. That same year, Bezos personally delivered his company's one millionth order to a customer in Japan who'd purchased a Windows NT manual and a Princess Diana biography. In 1998, Amazon extended beyond books and started selling music CDs. And by the following year, it had added more product categories such as toys, electronics, and tools. By the turn of the century, they shipped over 20 million items to 150 countries and Bezos had been named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. So they grew really quick. I'm not against selling online books or anything, but it's a shame what Amazon became as a result of growth. Whatever love of books Bezos and his wife shared, ironically, has made it harder for a number of bookstores to actually stay open. When Amazon sold its first book, Borders had a retail empire generating about $1.6 billion a year in sales. Now they're nothing but a memory, really. Investopedia says, call it death by Jeff. As the empire Jeff Bezos founded grows, companies are forced to adapt or close. However, one article from The New Yorker put this in a different light and published the following. It wasn't a love of books that led him to start an online bookstore. It was totally based on the property of books as a product, Shell Kaplan, Bezos' former deputy says. Books are easy to ship and hard to break. And there was a major distribution warehouse in Oregon. Crucially, there are far too many books in and out of print to sell even a fraction of them at a physical store. The vast selection made possible by the internet gave Amazon its initial advantage and a wedge into selling everything else. For Bezos to have seen a bookstore as a means to world domination at the beginning of the internet age, when there was already a crisis of confidence in the publishing world in a country not known for its book crazy public was a stroke of business genius. It's no coincidence Jeff Bezos chose a bookstore as Amazon's jumping off point. Thankfully, despite Amazon's success, independent booksellers are not only surviving, but their sales have actually grown over recent years. This is in no small part thanks to buy local movements, author readings, or even speed dating events that local bookstores host as a way of supplementing book sales alone. But the point of going down this road isn't just to point out how bookstores have had to survive. It's to illustrate the impact Amazon had as it grew. Just about everyone has to compete with them now. Amazon has grown to a point past what anyone could expect. And their initial little online bookstore has surpassed Walmart as the world's largest retailer. I'm sure we all know that they've had some issues. Maybe that, you know, the way they treat their employees leaves a little something to be desired, but how bad are they really? Well, let's get into it. One of their first issues that stood out as early as 2001 was their opposition to trade unions. 
Here in the US, they're typically called labor unions and it's defined as an association of workers in a particular trade, industry, or company created for the purpose of securing improvements in pay, benefits, working conditions, or social and political status through collective bargaining. But the reason why they're called a trade union issue is because this also happened across the pond in the UK. Two things happened that year. The first, according to Hausman's, is that amazon.co.uk hired a US management consultancy organization, the Burke Group, to defeat a campaign by graphical, paper, and media union to achieve recognition. UK union organizer, Peter Lockhart said, behind the shiny facade of Amazon and the internet are poor pay, poor conditions, poor communications, and poor management. It is anything but new age inside that distribution center. According to Unite the Union, Amazon continues to this day to see trade union representation as illegitimate. I know the topic of trade or labor unions might not seem all exciting as the crazy lawsuits we've seen in other episodes, but unions are very important, especially when someone works for a large company like Amazon, Google, Apple, you get the idea. These places need to be held to certain standards so they can't abuse their employees or leave them in unsafe working conditions. Employees need representation. They need their voices heard. According to the Economic Policy Institute, collective bargaining is how working people gain a voice at work and the power to shape their working lives. Now, it's not to say that unions are perfect because they most certainly are not. And there's a variety of opinions across the board about this. And I'm not trying to say that no aspect of unions whatsoever needs changing, but Amazon's specific methods of tackling the topic of unions has been very deceptive. The second event that happened in 2001 involving Amazon and labor unions took place in Seattle. Amazon laid off 850 Seattle employees after a unionizing drive. Funnily enough, this same article says that the company has never made a profit on its heavily discounted books, CDs, and other merchandise, and its share price has been in free fall for 10 months. Well, it's pretty obvious this was written in 2001 because Amazon's obviously doing just fine in terms of profit these days. But this behavior hasn't stopped. And if anything, it's gotten more alarming and it's simply been buried. Time Magazine said in January, 2014, that Amazon has successfully fended off a US labor union since its founding in 1994. On Wednesday, they did it once again. A small group of maintenance and repair technicians at an Amazon warehouse in Middleton, Delaware, voted 26 to one against joining the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. The results marked a major victory for Amazon, which risked organized labor gaining a toehold in its operations and using it to recruit tens of thousands of more fulfillment center workers across the country. The workers at Amazon faced intense pressure from managers and anti-union consultants hired to suppress this organizing drive. John Carr, a spokesperson for the union, wrote in an email. We've responded when these workers initially reached out to us and will continue to work with them to pursue the collective bargaining rights they're entitled to under federal labor law. Amazon has held off attempts at union organizing in the past. In 2000, for example, the Communication Workers of America started a campaign to unionize 400 customer service employees. But Amazon soon closed the call center where they worked as part of broader cuts following the internet boom years. In other instances, the company gave managers anti-union material to hand out and warnings on how to spot union organizing by being on the lookout for hushed conversations. So obviously Amazon is anti-union. Now, if they were upfront about this to their workers that they hire, then I don't know if I'd be quite so furious when I saw this. In a 2018 training video, Amazon stated clear as day, they're not anti-union. They said, we do not believe unions are in the best interest of our customers, shareholders, or our associates. Okay, but what about your employees? They say they do not badmouth unions and will speak to anyone with concerns because so far their history has just been literally firing anyone with concerns. So I just can't really take that as factual. And look, I can't know what's best for Amazon's entire operation. That goes way beyond my pay grade here, but it's the fucking deception that irritates me. When you say that you don't believe trade unions are the best interests of your customers, shareholders, or associates, you're saying it's bad for the bottom line for that dollar dollar bill. And that definitely angers me. And the fact that you put it in this cheesy little animated training video, like who did you think you were fooling really? Anyway though, in early 2020, Whole Foods, which is now owned by Amazon in case you didn't know, was discovered to have an interactive heat map monitoring its 510 locations across the US to assess union work. And that is creepy. Their scores, according to Business Insider, are based on racial diversity, employee loyalty, tip line calls, and violations recorded by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Whole Foods responded saying how they value a direct relationship with team members and their relationship, how open lines of communication empower workers to share feedback, and it just sounds like a lot of bullshit. How can Whole Foods or Amazon say they value open communication, but use this interactive heat map as a way to spy on their workers? 
And if they're not ashamed of it, then why would they hide that at all? The Observer said that, alarmingly, Whole Foods is not the only company that employs cutting edge technology to secretly track their workers. We previously chronicled how finance firms and banks measure workplace culture, employee satisfaction, and burnout rate using artificial intelligence. And that's just a bit fucked up. And that's all there is to say about it. Opposing unions is one thing, but the lies and the way they go about it, it's insanely dishonest. And we've only gotten through one of their controversies. Let's just take a quick break to thank today's sponsor, Daily Harvest. Now, many of you, I assume, even though we're staying at home, you have crazy busy schedules and not much has really changed, honestly. We're just home now, but we are just as busy, if not busier. And sometimes the idea of having to gather up a bunch of ingredients and cook something is just not the most entertaining idea in the world. I know it's not for me, but that changed thanks to Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers delicious food built on all organic fruits and vegetables directly to your door, and they only take minutes to prepare. Daily Harvest is ready when you are. Everything stays fresh in the freezer until you're ready to enjoy it. So you're wasting less food too. You don't need to overthink your meals of the week. Everything is ready and waiting from smoothies, flatbreads, harvest bowls, and even soups. Daily Harvest also has introduced their own almond milk, which is made up of only almonds and a dash of sea salt. That's it, which is super convenient so that you're always stocked up when you need some almond milk right in your smoothies. And something that's really important to me is that Daily Harvest is also committed to minimizing their environmental impact. They're in the process of transitioning to 100 100% compostable, recyclable, plant-based, and renewable fiber packaging. So if you wanna try a company where the food is delicious and good for you, and the packaging is good for the environment too, make sure to go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code CASKET to get $25 off your first box. Again, that's promo code CASKET for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Thank you, Daily Harvest, for sponsoring today's Corporate Casket. Now, obviously Amazon has just about every product under the sun on their website, but I want to go over a couple smaller issues and then we'll get into the counterfeit products because that's obviously an issue too. When I was going through the Wikipedia and trying to get a timeline and a sense for all of Amazon's issues, there was one blurb under controversies that I wanted to explore that got my blood particularly boiling. I honestly don't even remember this and it only took place in 2009, but apparently hundreds of LGBTQ book titles were stripped of their sales rank and labeled as adult material. Yep, labeled as porn because they featured lesbian or gay relationships. PC World stated, after discovering that the sales rankings for two new high profile LGBT books were missing, Props noticed his book, The Philly, was also devoid of this information. Without the ranking, titles are more difficult to find using Amazon's search function as best selling and high ranking titles are predominantly displayed. Props complained to Amazon and received this reply. In consideration of our entire customer base, we exclude adult material from appearing in some searches and bestseller lists. Since these lists are generated using sales ranks, adult materials must also be excluded from that feature. Since then, Amazon has informed various members of the press that the problem is a glitch and it's being fixed. PC World says they don't believe Amazon would unfairly target the LGBT community and negatively impact the sales of literature containing potentially risky or adult themes. However, it's evident that the company's computer has tagged these books as containing said themes. And once wide sweeping new policies are put into play, the LGBT community is directly targeted. For example, many risque books with strong heterosexual pornographic contents were not affected by this glitch. Amazon later said this was an embarrassing and ham-fisted cataloging error. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt on this, just as Probst, the author affected by the matter did. If he moved on, so will I. But it sure as hell feels weird, like we're adding more and more to the list of things Amazon needs to apologize for and properly recognize as an issue, not just a glitch. This brings us to the next noteworthy issue with Amazon, one that was large enough for the FTC themselves to step in. July 4th, 2014, the FTC sued Amazon, stating that they were promoting in-app purchases to kids, which were being purchased without the parents' consent. On page three of the lawsuit, they state the following. Amazon offers thousands of apps through its mobile app store, including games children are likely to play. In many instances after installation, children can obtain virtual items within a game, many of which cost real money. Amazon bills charges for items that cost money within the app, in-app charges to the parent. Amazon began billing for in-app charges in November, 2011, well after media reports about children incurring unauthorized charges in similar apps from other mobile app stores. Amazon nonetheless often had failed to obtain parents or other account holders informed consent to in-app purchases incurred by children. 
Just weeks after Amazon began billing for in-app charges, consumer complaints about unauthorized charges by children on Amazon's mobile devices reached levels on Amazon App Store manager described as near house on fire. I don't think I've ever heard something described as near house on fire before. I feel like I'd say it was like the house was on fire or, you know, just phrase it in some other way that makes sense. But you know, hey, I mess up phrases all the time too. So who who the fuck am I to judge? It was near house on fire levels of complaints. And this was in 2011, three years before the FTC even filed this lawsuit. That's more than enough time for Amazon to correct this issue. But because of the money coming in and because Amazon was already growing too big to touch me levels of success, they didn't do anything. Honestly, I feel bad for the parents that had to put up with this. You give your kid your phone to play a mobile game. And then when you're looking at this month's credit card bill, you see hundreds of dollars charged to the Amazon app. A lot of these little kids may not understand what's happening or the effects that it has on their parents. And Amazon exploited this enough to have the FTC get involved. That's really shitty. That's not necessarily a reason to never purchase from Amazon again, but just like with the LGBTQ glitch, it's a questionable business practice. So now we're going to move on to the counterfeit items. I will preface this by saying, yes, accidents happen. Sometimes even the best system to determine if a product is genuine can fail. The problem with this situation, however, isn't that Amazon made a rare mistake in their identification process. It's that they might as well have not even tried. In June, 2016, Fortune Magazine announced Amazon as one of the most influential and trustworthy companies among US adults. So it's safe to say that people believe the products coming from Amazon are genuine. Yet at the same time, they're being called trustworthy and reputable. Amazon sold counterfeit Apple products like power adapters and charging cables. The problem here isn't just that they were putting themselves on the line, but Apple as well. And it's not even as if there was just the occasional fake either. According to one source, over the past nine months, Apple, as part of its ongoing brand protection efforts, has purchased well over 100 iPhone devices, Apple power products, and lightning cables sold as genuine by sellers on amazon.com and delivered through Amazon's fulfillment by Amazon program. Apple's internal examination and testing of these products revealed almost 90% of the products are counterfeit. Apple is concerned that consumers are being deceived into purchasing counterfeit products on amazon.com and elsewhere in the mistaken belief that they're purchasing genuine Apple products. In addition to Apple's significant safety concerns for its consumers, these products, which are consistently poorly constructed, are unlikely to function as well as genuine Apple products. As a result, consumers will erroneously come to think that Apple products are of inferior quality and lose trust in the Apple brand, damaging the enormous goodwill associated with the Apple trademarks. And think about it. If you order a product from Amazon and it works fine at first, and then it slowly starts to fail or not function well over time, are you going to lose faith in Amazon or the product brand itself? Because chances are you would blame the product brand. So you would blame Apple. And believe me, I know Apple has its own issues and they've got plenty of money to fix this shit too, but it's not exactly like they're hurting because of this, but it's the principle of the issue. And the fact that this could just as easily happen to any other brand. And it actually has with a homegrown brand called Fuse Chicken. Forbes called it the David versus Goliath lawsuit of 2018 and wrote, John Fawcett, the founder and CEO of Fuse Chicken, an Ohio-based Kickstarter funded startup that makes innovative phone charging accessories, received a surprise when he had one of his products sent to the New York Times to be reviewed. What should have been a pinnacle moment for his company unraveled into a nightmare that has become indicative of the 21st century American entrepreneurial experience. The story goes on that the New York Times reviewer emailed Fawcett a few days after receiving the sample, wondering if he'd received the right product. Fawcett looked over the attached photos of what was supposed to be a bovine auto, one of Fuse Chicken's premier products, something which he designed himself, but couldn't identify what they were of. It looked like some sort of wiring harness Fawcett recollected, like what would be under a dashboard of a car or something like that. And it had an Amazon sticker on it that said bovine auto. This was something that didn't even look like our product. It turned out that the New York Times reviewer received a shoddy Chinese counterfeit of what should have been an innovative and high quality American product. So at first I'd never heard of this Fuse Chicken brand. So I went to purchase a Fuse Chicken product like this Bobine Auto as an average consumer, not knowing what the thing looked like. And you know, I'd get a Chinese counterfeit. Like I wouldn't buy from them again. I'd figure their products just weren't up to my standards and they could take pretty photos. But then when I open the box, the reality is just not what I bought. And I think that's what most people would do. Maybe even leave a bad review while they're at it. And according to Fuse Chicken, Amazon wouldn't remove these bad reviews negatively impacting their brand either. As far as I can tell, they're either trying to or already have reached a settlement out of court with Amazon since there are not any recent articles about this case. However, that doesn't mean people aren't still speaking up about the issue. 
The Washington Post put out an article in 2019 explaining how Amazon's automated system to combat fakes, knockoffs, and counterfeit products simply wasn't enough. One technique in their video was abbreviation, calling a handbag LV instead of Louis Vuitton. I've mentioned counterfeit products on this channel before and how dangerous knockoffs can be in their own. But we have to consider the what ifs here. If Amazon doesn't crack down on selling counterfeit bags, what about knockoff makeup? What about other counterfeit products that are even more harmful? By the way, Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos himself and they acknowledge that in the video. So they end with a little counterfeits persist on Amazon, fake or real, they make a sale either way. It's kind of hardly a surprise. They barely touch on the true dangers of these counterfeits, though Business Insider did in 2018. And here's what they said. A recent report from the Government Accountability Office revealed that products purchased from third-party sellers on five major e-commerce sites could be counterfeit and harmful to your health. Out of 47 products, all Nike Air Jordan shoes, Yeti travel mugs, Urban Decay makeup, and UL certified phone chargers, investigators bought from Amazon, Walmart, eBay, Sears Marketplace, and Newegg, 20 were counterfeit. All of the shoes were authentic and only one UL certified phone charger was fake, but it was a whole different ballpark with the other two categories. Six of nine Yeti travel mugs and all Urban Decay makeup were fake. It's unknown which products came from which retailer, but it is known that one counterfeit item and one authentic item was purchased from each site. Not only are consumers being duped, they're being exposed to potentially dangerous materials. The report claimed that counterfeit iPhone adapters can pose a risk of lethal electrocution, counterfeit travel mugs can include higher lead concentrations, and counterfeit cosmetics contain substances such as cyanide, mercury, and rat droppings. Those are things you don't want in your hands or on your face. What's doubly concerning is that it's hard to discern the difference between what's fake and what's real. All items all shipped to the US were advertised as new and name brand and were sold by third-party sellers with average customer ratings above 90%. All factors that instill a higher sense of confidence and trust in the buyer. And it's not as if you just can't do any online shopping ever again. I know that's unrealistic, but Amazon is unable to handle this problem as far as I can tell. And they're going to continue to be unable to handle this problem. And it's bigger than them. All this means is that even if you can trust Amazon, maybe you don't trust the name brands that they're selling. Buy your luxury items from the store. If you want to guarantee its authenticity, don't do that through Amazon. Amazon's environmental impact is also extremely negative. We're talking 44 million metric tons of carbon dioxide in the year 2018 alone. And I'm not saying they can completely help this. Any large company is going to emit carbon dioxide and have some kind of effect on the environment. But the problem many people have with Amazon and the climate isn't just that they're harming it, but they've funded climate denial groups. On its website and publicly, Amazon made pledges to be net zero carbon across their business by 2040. Jeff Bezos says that himself, and he was the first signer of this climate pledge. Their corporate site states, as of writing this, that, Human-induced climate change is real, serious, and action is needed from the public and private sectors. The overwhelming majority of climate scientists agree that human activities are contributing to climate warming trends over the past century, and most leading scientific organizations worldwide have issued public statements endorsing this position. We agree, and we have created the Climate Pledge a commitment to reach the Paris Agreement 10 years early. We are innovating and investing to be net zero carbon by 2040 and run on 100% renewable energy by 2030. We are purchasing 100,000 fully electric delivery vehicles, the largest order ever for electric delivery vehicles and investing $100 million in nature-based climate solutions and reforestation projects all around the world to begin removing carbon from the atmosphere now. Our sustainability website provides comprehensive reporting on our carbon footprint and progress to our commitments. But this is what they tell the public. This is the narrative Amazon creates for itself. When in reality behind the scenes, they've consistently undermined climate science throughout their history. In 2019, the New York Times explained that it's difficult to figure out who's funding climate denial because many of the think tanks that continue to question established climate science are nonprofit groups that are not required to disclose their donors. However, one of these, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, did include a list of corporate donuts at one of their galas last year. Make no mistake, the Competitive Enterprise Institute believes global warming is a myth, despite mountains of evidence that say otherwise. And look, if you don't believe in global warming, I'm not even gonna begin to change your mind. Those kinds of arguments go in circles and that's not what this video is about, nor am I interested in hearing your conspiracy theories. Until you have something factual to back up those statements, they stay as conspiracy theories, which is what they are, and you a conspiracy theorist. 
But going back to what I find interesting here is that Amazon was on the list of Competitive Enterprise Institute's list of corporate donors. One minute they say they want to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions and sign a climate pledge, and on the next they're funding these people. And it's a bit messed up. A spokeswoman for Amazon even said they may not agree with all position these companies take, but they figured their $15,000 contribution would still help advance policy objectives aligned with our interests. Like, damn, they did not pay you enough to make that statement. This organization goes directly against what Amazon claims to stand for in terms of climate change, but it's fine because they got a few things in common. No, don't support an organization you can't believe in when there's alternatives out there. This just shows how little Amazon actually gives a damn about their climate pledge. Sure, they're a business. They have to care about making money. I get that, but this dishonesty just kills me. But as if we needed further proof that they do not put their money where their mouth is, they nixed a green shipping proposal. This would be an option for customers where they could choose a green shipping delivery option, a slightly slower delivery speed designed to give Amazon more time to cluster orders together to send out densely packed vehicles, saving on fuel, driver salaries, and carbon emissions. Frankly, that sounds like a great idea. Sure, one of Amazon's selling points is their prime delivery, but I don't know about you, but if I saw the option, I'd probably take advantage of that. I don't really need anything that I order within two days, honestly, and I can wait a little longer if it means that it's helping with carbon emissions, but it wasn't implemented because Amazon didn't want shoppers to think twice before clicking the buy now button. The Seattle Times explains, Amazon's push to make its operations more climate friendly is at odds with elements of the company's core business practices, some current and former employees and outside observers say. Bezos' company is in many ways designed to promote consumption. From one-click shopping to one-day shipping, many employees are encouraged to focus on a set of goals geared towards removing barriers to shopping and inventing new ways of pleasing customers before they think to ask. That obsessive focus has helped make Amazon the largest online retailer in the world. It also makes climate activists and sustainability experts, many of whom cheer the company's bold new goals, skeptical of Amazon's odds of success. What they're trying to do is create a climate and culture of consumption, says Raz Goldenick, a professor at the New School's Parsons School of Design who focuses on sustainability. That means more products will be manufactured, more products will be shipped, more products will be returned. If you look at the numbers, it means overall a zero carbon contribution is not possible. Their zero carbon emission goal is nothing but words. Realistically, I think we probably know that. Amazon being zero carbon is kind of a pipe dream. It's just really infuriating that they make it less and less possible for themselves to be green by ignoring this green shipping option. And then by going around and funding people that believe climate change is a fucking myth. And talk about shooting yourself in the foot. I could seriously go on about how angry this makes me, but somehow we've still got plenty, plenty more to cover. But unfortunately for today, that is where today's episode of The Corporate Casket is going to end. We will peck back up on this in the second episode or the second installment on Amazon. It will be the final conclusion as well. So like I said, we've got so much more to cover that it's going into another episode. So make sure to stay tuned for that. But as always, thank you all for making it to another episode and I will see you in the next one. Bye. 